we're going into the next session where we're going to talk about um, the way a simple problem is mapped to different targets or different architecture uh, uh, in different sessions. So we're going to start with uh, Dan Bailey's talk uh, from Intel. So let's see how Intel maps the problem to their target. Hi, yeah, so I'm uh, Dan Daly from Intel. Whoa, I have to back off of that thing. Uh, actually, I might not even use it. Uh, so, uh, you know, at Intel, uh, I wanted to go into some slides on the, the value of P4 uh, and why it's different from what we've been doing with processors and NICs and switches and all of this in the past. Uh, and, uh, the, I think the most valuable thing about this is is that it's programmable versus flexible, uh, and uh, you know this is how uh, we're mapping it to our architecture is to sort of change the mindset. If you are a, if you're working on a project for you know half a decade and you need to expose it somehow to your um, to your users, in the past what we've done is we've added flexibility to that product or that architecture so that software can come down and program it. Um, and, you know, my favorite example here on the host side is RSS. So we gave an interface, we worked with Microsoft to give an interface to uh, a, a VM or to an application to be able to spread traffic to multiple cores um, inside of a platform. And that's a really, really valuable um, feature. So what we did was we told, uh, and we tell the OS or we tell the driver, you know, the parameters by which to program that RSS, uh, and it maps really well to our hardware. Um, and so you can see that it, it's sort of the data plane saying, hey, Windows, I support your RSS spec, so go ahead and configure it um, as needed. Um, and it sort of captures, it, it tells you what is, what's possible, um, you know, uh, with the data plane underneath. Um, but then we start to run into problems with that sort of interface when something, and it might be a, a very small perturbation it, to that feature where, you know, you need, you need to extend that interface somehow. So with RSS, the important, or, or uh, some of these other functions like OpenFlow, where we say, well, I, I like the pipeline that you've defined, but we need to add a new action. And so now we, we rev the spec to add that new action. And so then becomes this, uh, this tension as to, what is in the spec versus what is in my data plane versus what is required in the control plane. So if we can flip that relationship around and say, uh, I understand that your, your uh, pipeline or your hardware or your implementation is very flexible, but instead of you telling me what you can do, I want to know, uh, I, want, I want to tell you what I need. Um, uh, so that I have more control over, uh, over what's done on, on my behalf. Uh, and that's sort of a programmable data plane. Now it makes, it requires that the substrate that you implement your data plane in is very, is very programmable. Uh, but it, it, that change in semantic um, drives the architecture of the API and it drives the architecture of the, of the data plane. And, and, and for us, this is a, 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 you know, a, a reverse of the regular thinking of how we build um, something that is programmable versus flexible. And so what you end up with is sort of a, an executable specification. So we want to start with a, with a specification that we can run and uh, test out and get and, and drive all the bugs out before we go and optimize it. So, uh, and this is sort of uh, I think some of the presentations before this follows very nicely with the, the P4 flow, which, uh, you know, we configure each of these stages that we're putting into our data plane, um, and we sequence them. And sometimes the sequencing changes depending on the application. You know, I want to do, I want to segment the packet before I encrypt it, or I want to encrypt everything together and then segment it. You know, the, the sequencing really matters. Um, uh, and then the data plane needs to know what, what, what orders uh, are the different operations. And then once I define all that, I really don't want to have to write a new API every time, so having them auto-generated like we do in P4 is really valuable. Um, and so what you end up with is a sort of a, a target agnostic uh, spec <coughs> that you can run and test and throw packets through and what have you. Um, uh, and it, 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 it sort of keeps you above the fray. So if you, if you were working on a project for 
half of a decade, you don't get stuck in the mindset of, well, my, the, the thing that I've been working on for so long only works in this way. And so that's really the only way I can expose it. It should be the other way around to say, well, what is, what is it that the control plane needs for me so that I can implement the, the requirements as, it, as it's specified? So the P4 gives you that sort of, sort of uh, target agnostic zone. Uh, and that's really important for trying to map it to multiple um, different architectures. But how do you get from something that's totally agnostic to something that's actually uh, you can run and, and, uh, and, and implement? Um, and so that, that's where the mapping comes. Is, uh, so we, we end up with this, uh, this flow where you, you, you specify the data plane in, in, in an application-centric way. So my application needs to do this lookup. It needs to hold this packet. It needs to do this segmentation. Um, uh, it may have certain you know, special blocks in the logic where it has to go and do some arbitrary computation where you know, some of the things that we do in P4 with our external C functions is really useful. So you specify all that. Uh, and then you need to be able to run that uh, before you can give it to someone to go optimize it. You need to go and execute it, run it in your environment, and you know, if the sort of executable software model was fast enough, then you'd be done. Then you have completed the, the necessary training to um, go in and, and implement the, the function in the network that you need. Um, so the last step is where we target it to the different um, uh, targets that we have. So you may say that, um, well, in order for this to run efficiently, I need to use some of the special CPU instructions that we've um, added over the years to maybe it needs to be vectorized, maybe you need to use some of the cryptographic functions that we have in the CPU. Or you may have to bypass parts of the OS in order to get faster performance, uh, which is where we have DPDK. Um, and so in the future, I think that this flow enables um, you know, more programmable devices that are accelerators or FPGAs um, that uh, uh, can take a, uh, a, a concisely defined specification and, and push that into a, um, a high performance substrate. Uh, so that's sort of the uh, um, that's sort of the philosophy reversal that we've taken is to understand understand the problem and define it in a concise manner um, before we go in and try to commit that to a, you know a, a big program that needs to, that needs to run all of this in a, in a, in a faster type data plane. That's it. Any questions? Yeah. Excuse me? So what happens in, uh, in this picture is that once you do the comp compilation step, there's a set of you know, structures that you're going to put into your pipeline. So for example, let's say my first P4 program has five tables, and my next one has 10 tables. So there is a pipeline configuration step that needs to go into the, into the pipeline that's programmable. And that only happens when you um, either reboot the system or you change the program that's running on the, uh, on the data plane. Yeah, it would be a new release or a new table or a new action that goes into the, into the pipeline that has, that has been defined in P4. As opposed to just populating tables or adding entries into the table, that's, that's part of the runtime. So there's a separation in this, it's just from the P4 paper, which is uh, sort of there's a configuration stage that could be essentially op optional. You could always just come up with a certain configuration and then a runtime stage to do all the uh, rule population Statistics, uh, you know, all of those roles. Yeah. Limitations on the FPGA. Um, how much you can emit from the FPGA block? Are you limited by the amount of data? Limitations on the FPGA. No, I, I probably can't. Uh, there's the Intel FPGAs are limitless. So, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so that that's yeah um, yeah of course so I think that that's why you start with uh, uh, that's why you do so that's why our mantra is software first let's implement it in the software and you're gonna find that that's gonna run it and perform at a certain level and the next step you would take is well let's go do that in FPGA because we have some really nice projects that integrate nicely with that 
if you find limits with that, then, then you have to go to some other accelerator or some other maybe bespoke type of solution to, to get there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it, it, it's definitely a, a spectrum. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. So our next speaker is Antonin. Um, if you have used P4 Dev or P4 Discuss mailing list, you will notice him. Right? He immediately catches and offers help. So he's the guy uh, maintaining the, the P4 software switch, BMV2. Um, so he's representing People Language Consortium uh, to talk about the way P4 program is mapped to BMB2. All right, so uh, I'll try to keep it brief because we're running out of time. Uh, so what is BMB2? Uh, so you've seen like uh, one demo, Cheng's demo, the INT demo, uh, running uh, multiple BMB2 switches. So BM stands for uh, behavioral mole. So V2 because it's uh, version two. Um, so what we did is up to a year ago, uh, we used to take the P4 uh, program and generate C code. And there was a project called P4 C Behavioral. And that's what um, Mohammed used as a basis for his uh, OVS uh, switch. Uh, and a year ago, we decided that uh, we wanted to provide something more convenient uh, to people developing in P4. So uh, instead of having auto-generated C code, which is based on the P4 program, we decided that BMV2 would be loading uh, your P4 program when it's starting and that you would not have to recompile anything, uh, any C code when you change your P4 program. So BMV2 is a C++ user space software switch uh, which emulates the P4 data plane. Uh, it's aimed at being 100% conformant to the P4 specification and I think that's uh, an important point uh, because in the P4 spec, you can do arbitrary arithmetic on fields and metadata. Uh, you have like stateful memories. You have a lot of stuff which can be hard to do in a performant way in a software switch. And so BMV2 trades off performance to be 100% compliant with the P4 spec. As I said, there is no recompilation required when you switch a P4 program. Uh, it's also architecture dependent, which means that BMV2 is essentially a library which, been, which can be used to emulate any P4 enabled uh, device. Uh, maybe an ASIC, uh, maybe a NIC, anything which can be programmed using P4. And we also have a set of tools to make uh, development easier. So a runtime CLI uh, to program uh, the data plane and uh, GDB like debugger, which I will actually be presenting uh, tomorrow at the workshop. Uh, so this is a workflow. Uh, you start with a P4 program. It goes uh, through the uh, P4C BM compiler. This is a tense compiler for P4 you're hearing about today. Uh, we get a JSON program, which is kind of the assembly equivalent, uh, but for P4 and BMV2. And then you have your switch, so it's a user space switch. We use libpcap by default to uh, read packets from interfaces. Um, and as I said, the CLI, uh, the runtime APIs, and on top of the runtime APIs, the, your application. Uh, so we use the P4HLIR, which is open sourced on P4Lang. I've been hearing about it a little bit, to generate the JSON representation, which is consumed by the switch. So JSON is actually very, very close to the P4 program. It's uh, just something that can be consumed easily by, uh, by our executable. Um, and uh, we use this JSON uh, in several parts, actually, uh, in the debugger in, to generate the, uh, the runtime APIs, which uh, John uh, showed you this morning. When we generate these APIs for BMV2, we actually use this JSON. Um, and uh, the goal is as P4 evolves, uh, I'm guessing you'll probably hear more about it tomorrow, uh, the JSON uh, remains the same. Of course, when we add new objects to P4 and in P4v1.2, we added the concept of extern. We have to make like small changes to the JSON, but essentially we keep the schema backwards compatible. So I'll go very quickly over that slide. On the left, you have a P4 table and on the right, 
uh, I mean, removed some attributes, but essentially it's a JSON which is consumed by uh, BMV2. Uh, and I wanted to spend a little bit more time, uh, time on that slide. Um, so BMV2 is meant as a tool to promote, promote innovation uh, in the P4 ecosystem, so it becomes very, very easy, and I hope you'll see that uh, during the end on, uh, to write a P4 program, change your P4 program, test it, test it again, and write an application on top of it. Um, however, because we want uh, BMV2 to be really close to the P4, so we can do nice uh, live debugging, uh, stepping through the program line by line, uh, we essentially have to keep things close to the P4 program, which reduces the number of optimi optimizations we can do. If you have like 50 tables in your P4 program, you will have 50 tables uh, in BMV2, and that means 50 lookups. Um, and so right now, for very simple P4 program, we can do uh, above 100,000 packets per second, but when you go to switch.p4, which is a data center program on P4 lang, which has like 50 tables, stateful memories, counters, meters, uh, we are actually at 10,000 packets per second. So. People have approached me uh, offering suggestions to increase performance and we will be integrating some. Uh, however, we don't want to compromise on what makes BMV2 convenient, which are all the tools stepping through the pro program, not having to recompile any C or C++ code when the P4 program changes. So it's more of a, it's not a production tool, it's more of a development tool. Um, and uh, yeah, and you've heard about uh, several projects. I'm thinking about the uh, OVS project from Moramad and uh, the eBPF Intel project, which will give you the performance that you want, but maybe you won't have all the P4 features uh, which are covered by the spec of today. Uh, yeah, and I don't think we have time for this uh, slide, but essentially, as I said, BMV2 is target independent and I encourage people who have an ASIC, which is meant to be P4 enabled, to try to implement their ASIC target using the BMV2 library to get uh, a similar behavior as the hardware. And um, uh, as a reference, we have a target on P4 language, which is called Simple Switch, which was only implemented in uh, 600 lines of code uh, using the BMV2 library. Thank you. So one great thing about Antonin is that he always keeps deadline. And today he told me that he would need only five minutes. He really finished it in five minutes. Right? So let's hear about another hardware target, uh, Xilinx FPGA. Um, so Gordon is going to give a summary about the way a P program is mapped to their FPGA target. And I believe that uh, Xilinx FPGA target is also unlimited, just like Intel FPGA. <laughs> Okay, so there are, someone, asked, someone asked about FPGAs as a target, so I, I'm your man. So, so I, my day job is with an FPGA company. So j just as a background, in case people don't know what a field programmable data array is, uh, you can think about it as white box hardware. So it's uh, just a sea of logic gates, and you can program the logic gates to whatever you want. So yeah, my, my, my mantra is you, know, you have white box software plus white box hardware together, serendipity and programmability, as Dan mentioned. I, you know, just to give the scale of it, you know, when, I, when I got interested in FPGAs uh, 100 years ago, you know, they were tiny little devices. You couldn't do anything now. We're up to about uh, marketing numbers, 3.5 million kind of logic cell kind of things on it with all sorts of stuff floating around. So that's the technology we have. and. Yeah, the good thing, I waited a long time for this, you can now do complex packet processing on a single FPJ, which was kind of virtually impossible just a few years ago. And also put them together with other chips. So uh, Corsa, for example, a company have this multiple FPJ based uh, uh, 100 gig switch just uh, announced last week, in fact. 
and uh, often you put an FPGA beside some dumber switching devices to add some intelligence, etc. You can even put them beside CPUs, though. Uh, who would want to do that? So. What, what we had, and this is, I'm in Xilinx Labs, which is a CTO office, as uh, Xilinx has a, it's a product called SDNet that started out as Xilinx Labs. And basically it's a flow from a high level language, which we call PX, which actually predates P4, but is about 85 to 90% overlapping. So uh, the, there aren't too many ideas floating around in the Bay Area. And what, what it does is try to take the misery out of doing hardware design for FPGAs, because I'm a software person, so these are tools for people like me. And the idea is to take the high-level description, which, as I say, is uh, in PX. It goes through a compiler, and it's a kind of device-independent description in PX, and you take in other parameters, like how fast you want it to go and latency goals. And then that outputs a hardware description language implementation. Then you have the standard uh, FPGA process that takes the HDL, uh, Xilinx calls the tools Vivado, and uh, then you get the programming for the FPGA. And also, so you don't have to go through this timing, time consuming step repeatedly, uh, we build some sort of firmware into the architecture. So you, if you do a small update, uh, you can just update the firmware rather than having to update the hardware. So that, that, that's the kind of thing that exists. And uh, our, our challenge last year, a year ago or so, was to translate P4 world into that. So you'll, you'll recognize this diagram. Uh, uh, anyone who's seen P4 before or from this morning, you know, this is the basic pipeline, the architecture that's built into the current P4 spec with the parser and the match action table pipelines. So, so what we did, and we started this about a year ago and demonstrated it at the first P4 workshop, it is a mapping from P4 world into the world of PX, which I don't have time to tell you about, but you'll notice uh, I just added with my overlay the D parser there, so the normal architecture picture doesn't mention that, it's a kind of hidden object. So basically what we're doing is mapping the parser into something we call a parsing engine in our world, and the D parser into an editing engine, and then each match action table is, is a lookup engine that does a lookup in a table, and the editing engine actually does actions on the behalf. So basically what we've done is write a little uh, cross-translator from, from P4 world. And Basically, this is how it goes. This is what we demonstrated last year, is uh, to take the front end from p4.org, which goes to HLIR, which you'll have heard mentioned earlier today, and then uh, our, our own kind of Python-esque contribution is uh, a cross mapper, which uh, takes P4 over to PX. And as I say, there's an there's a increasingly small gap between the two languages, so this is, this is not a major technical feat. Uh, to do this, and then it goes through the standard uh, uh, SD, well, at the time it was the next product release, that, that was last year, that's now been released, and then uh, finally, uh, this is a board we took along uh, last year to the workshop, and it's a 4 by 100 gig development board, which uh, Xilinx normally uses for demonstrating 400 gig Ethernet, but we uh, redeployed it to demonstrate like a 100 gig data path. So that's a, that's a basic flow, and the idea is to take the misery out of FPGA design, uh, so you can program in P4 and get your pipeline on, onto the, uh, the, the board. So the, the, this is a kind of 25K dollar board. So uh, what we're showing tomorrow, or at least one of our friends from Stanford is showing tomorrow, is uh, anyone who's in, in, the, in the, the FPGA for networking world. NetFPGA originated here in Stanford, in fact, uh, some years ago, and is now at a generation which has a 4x10 gig switch. So this, this is a reference design that comes, uh, comes with NetFPGA, and there's at least one member of the audience who's thoroughly steeped in this reference design, uh, Mohammed there. So th th this exists, and what, what we're doing tomorrow is implanting P4. Uh, th this design is written in Verilog, uh, so you have to be a bit of a hardware, a hardware chap to do it is to take the pipeline I just showed you generated from P4 and essentially substitute that block. You see the input arbiter is uh, aggregating 
four, ten gig ports together, the output queues are disaggregating it, is to substitute that block in the reference design so you can just plug in a P4 generated block. So instead of the example uh, thing that comes with NetFPGA, so that way we can make this available to the uh, research community. So for the future, one of the changes, and uh, if you're back tomorrow, you'll hear a bit more about this. The evolution of P4 is to try and separate out the architecture and language uh, aspects so one doesn't have this single built-in switch architecture anymore. You can actually describe different target architectures. And this is a slide I, I stole from Chang, who had it uh, at the last workshop in November. The, the idea is, as you see here, that P4.org defines a standard architecture, uh, you know, a bit like what exists at the moment in the language spec, but other target providers can define different targets. And uh, with the FPJ, what we have the ability is not just to say, here's one target architecture, but you can actually program up your favorite target architecture, and then that will plug into the P4 model. So what we're doing at the moment with our, our demo, if you like, is modeling the standard P4 pipeline on the FPGA. This will allow us to define other kind of architectures and different kind of pipelines uh, on the FPGA. And the, this, this is the, the kind of future P4 flow, if you like. You, you select your architecture, and then the program kind of plugs into that architecture and uh, out comes your data plane and the API as before. So uh, the, the, this is where we're optimistic about FPGAs having a way of defining kind of the people's target architectures in hardware. So that's uh, all I'm going to say since we're uh, running out of time. I'll take one question, two questions. So the intention is that uh, people do not need to see the HDL. So the idea is you program in P4, and what SDNet does, it doesn't just generate random HDL. It's a, a microarchitecture template, which is actually engineered for 100 gig rates or down. Well, we can do 400 gig, but that's, that's research. So the idea is the user doesn't see the HDL. My experience is, and I was saying to someone at the break, I think it's like high-level language compilers in the 60s. Most people want to see the HDL you're generating because they don't believe it. So uh, pe people often ask to see that. But this, this is really designed for networking people and software people, not for hardware people. So we could model a programmable ASIC on the FPGA, and in some ways the firmware I mentioned is a bit like that. What I prefer, and actually this was my talk at the previous workshop, is you, you can actually change your architecture on the FPGA. So it's more than just reprogramming it, you can actually re-architect it. Uh, so there's a bit of a continuum in what you can actually change. So it doesn't have to be a fixed data path. You can actually change the data path and program the data path, if you see what I mean. Yeah, that, that's why we put in the firmware, because obviously anyone who knows about FPJ design, that step I alluded to in the corner can be very time-consuming and uh, error-prone, as you say. So the idea of putting in the firmware was if you make a, quote, modest change to the program, you don't have to go through that again. Okay, let's thank Gordon. Uh, should you change this slide? Change the view. So uh, we we're originally going to have another hardware architecture or hardware uh, backend explanation from Metronome, but uh, because of the time, <laughs> Johan actually graciously accepted or agreed to merge his architecture talk with uh, the hands-on lab session, because we have a dedicated hands-on lab session for Metronome target. So we're going to talk about that later, and thanks, Johan, for that. So we're not missing that hardware target. Metronome and Q-based target is very important, but you will be actually using that today. And then the last hardware target is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, software target is OBS. 
And uh, as you can see, OBS and EBPF, the two strong advantage of this software target is that they're already out there. There's huge you know, deployment base out there. So if you can program this OBS and EBPF target using P4, it's a huge advantage for the customers as well as target providers. So he's going to talk about his work on OBS, people program of OBS. Right. So first of all, my apologies for popping up again. Uh, <laughs> so it seems like uh, I'm teasing out these details about the compiler one step at a time. So, so yeah. So, so, th so this is uh, so th this talk is about again P4 to open vSwitch, but this time I'm gonna dig down a bit more into what the compiler is. Uh, though not that much. That's for tomorrow. So, uh, yeah. So. So the, the, the compiler is like the P4 to open vSwitch compiler, we call it PySys. It's also appearing as a sitcom paper uh, this year. So why P4 and open vSwitch? So P4, as we know, is like becoming a, uh, like a gold star language for defining how the switching pipeline should operate. And open vSwitch, as, we, as has been seen so far, is one of the uh, implementations that provides fast packet processing. So, so that's why, like, because Open vSwitch provides this fast pa packet processing, can we use the same uh, sort of like ease, ease in describing the behavior of the switch pipeline using that fast packet processing pipeline as well? So, before moving on, I'll just talk briefly about the P4 abstract forwarding model. So, I think previously Gordon mentioned like gave you a different picture of like what a abstract like uh, the forwarding model that P4. P4 has, but in I think in terms of open V switch or software switches, we don't have this queuing part in the middle. So we'll just have a packet parser, a collection of match action tables, and then a packet D parser. So what P4 does is it allows you to declare, uh, define these or specify these components in a declarative way. Uh, it provides syntax as we have seen already for specifying headers, parsers, actions, and so forth. On the other hand, open V switch has a bit uh, of a more complicated architecture where there is a fast path and a slow path. So fast path is more like where the packet parsing is happening and, and then along with packet parsing, instead of doing match action pipelines, uh, what happens is like there is, there, is a, there is a set of caches that are sitting in there. So why a cache? Because it gives you a single lookup cost versus doing a multi lookup cost in, a, in, a, in the collection of match action tables. So what happens is like when a packet comes in, uh, it, it is parsed through the packet parser seen into the two caches, if, if, if an entry is found, then instead of going to the collection of match action tables, it, the actions are actually looked up into the, in the cache and then applied on the packet directly. So if there's a miss in both the caches, then you eventually end up going into the match action tables. And what happens is like after processing the packet, a new flow rule is generated, which is then installed into the megaflow and microflow cache. So again, uh, you can think of microflow in terms of a standard CPU architecture as L1 cache and a megaflow cache, uh, cache as a layer two cache. So what is the problem? The problem now is like, how can we compile one packet with like the P4 abstract forwarding model onto the OBS forwarding model? So that's the, that's the high level idea there. Um, so what happens like we, we, the first goal is to take the packet parser and try to map it onto open vSwitch. The second part is like, how can we take these custom match action tables and map them onto this overall structure, which is the, the match action tables in the slow path, as well as the caches in the fast path. And then finally, uh, the, uh, how to do packet deparsing as well. So in order to support these changes in OVS, we actually modified the OVS to add support for a bunch of different things so that it can actually support all the different uh, packet forwarding models that uh, or programs that P4 can specify. So we added support for inline versus post pipeline editing. Uh, I'll, I won't go into the details of these, I'll just hash them. So, so, so again, if you want to look into the details, come tomorrow and we will talk more in the talk and the demo. And then we added support for arbitrary encapsulation and decapsulation because Open vSwitch, as of now, only supports uh, a fixed set of encapsulation and decapsulation protocols. And then there was other thing where we wanted to add support and obvious was to do uh, sort of comparisons based on header fields. Like, for example, right now you cannot do like a header field equal another header field. That is not supported in the in the in the in the overall abstraction that Open vSwitch provides. So we added support for that, and then we added support for general checksum verify and update uh, functions in Open vSwitch as well. So overall, this is uh, like how like what is the workflow of a PySys compiler, like a P4 to Open vSwitch compiler? We take a P4 program, the compiler compiles it into a bunch of different C codes, as I already showed you in the, in the demo, and 
what happens is like the compiler is not only just generating these C files, it's also doing some domain specific optimizations that are tailored towards open vSwitch. Um, and then uh, the LLVM com uh, like compiler compiles the actual uh, source code into the uh, final executable that runs on x86 or other architectures. And we also ge like generate a flow rule type checker to ensure that if all the rules that are coming in from the control plane, they actually comply with what is specified in the P4 program itself. So, be like before concluding, I just want to talk a bit about like the causes of perf performance degradation in OBS, a question that Bob actually raised in the last talk. Uh, though I will not go into that level of detail, but I'll just talk briefly about what are the different aspects that affect performance. So one is the per packet cost. That is the end-to-end -end, uh, cost of consume, uh, that end-to-end uh, -end cost of CPU cycles that are consumed by a machine for processing, or by a switch for processing a single packet. And the other one is the number of times the packet has to be sent to the slow path to be processed by the match action tables. So in order to improve the performance, we implemented a bunch of optimizations in uh, Open vSwitch, so uh, in, in our compiler. Uh, we implemented five optimizations to, to reduce the per packet cost that is induced when, by compiling P4 to open vSwitch. And also uh, two, two optimizations uh, for, for this work only, but there can be many more. But the ones we found like more uh, significant were uh, these two, to reduce the number of slow, pit, uh, slow pass trips uh, in the slow path, like the packet, how many times the packet is being processed by the match action tables. So eventually for, for just to give you a, a rough estimate of where the performance is, uh, we ran a bench, like we, we implemented a benchmark application, like a router with an access control list. Uh, we saw that naively compiling without any optimization, Pythons was performing like two times slower than a native open vSwitch. And after doing, uh, applying these optimizations, we saw that the performance was like increased by a huge amount. Like it was now comparable to what the native OVS was performing, like less than 2% degradation in performance. And so, Again, in summary, uh, we talked about like compiling P4 to open vSwitch. We, I briefly talked about the causes of degradation in performance and some optimizations to mitigate those uh, performance. So in, at the end, P4 plus OVS, we hope, is equal to fast packet forwarding. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. So the requirement for the open, open vSwitch version is the modifications that we did to add support for the features that P4 supports. So it's not the vanilla OVS, it's the, it's the one with the, with the additions that we have added in, in the open vSwitch code itself. So you can look at that code in the repository that is here. Um, so the API itself is a, it's not OpenFlow itself, it's the, it's in the CDI extensions. Like you're not only limited to what OpenFlow gives you in terms of the fields that you can match on, but now you can match on any field. So the interface is more like OpenFlow, but now you can match on your custom header fields and do actions based on what the P4 is telling you. So, so right now we are using the open vSwitch command line utilities for programming it, and then we are running, we are implementing a shim which is auto-generated by P4 to allow the controller to uh, install rules in, in OVS. Using, using OpenFlow extensions or using P4 analytics versus another? Analytics? So that's the, so that's the, the con uh, like, so for now, for this uh, implementation that we have, we are using, the, we are ha we have extended the command line utilities that open vSwitch gave you, like, like OVS, OFCTL, and so forth, and then we write a ship, shim on top of it that Im implements thrift or something else uh, to install the rules. Oh, so it's, and you thought of, of uh, integrating it into OVS? Right, no, that, that's the ongoing work. We haven't actually, like, so the, the goal of this work was to see what is the effect on performance. So we are still, like, we, the next step is to look into how to integrate it more optimally with the controller. Okay, let's thank Shabazz. Thank you.